Okay, here we are, and we're doing our interview with Lee. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, and I'm Andy from Drake and Stone, and uh, just wanted to interview you today and find out what you're up to and what projects you're launching. Right, so uh, at Gaddis Gaming, we're all uh, busy uh, trying to get all those components together for our, our Kickstarter that we successfully launched back in December. So it's uh, featuring our guards rule set, um, and we're focusing this time on World War II, uh, building on our successful World War I launch of Shattered Crown, which was our uh, ode to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Harlem Hellfighters. And this one I'm dedicating to my grandfather's from the 761st Tank Battalion, uh, the original Black Panthers. And we're just doing a, a quick two-player starter set with the guard rules. Um, you get your, you know, inside you get your tokens, you get, you know, your miniatures that we make, you get your uh, custom dice, you know, with the Black Panther symbol on them. That's cool. And, uh, and of course, the guards rules. So we're, get, we're getting that all together, putting it all together and getting it out the door to be mailed out to everybody. Uh, we find out, even though everything's being made in the United States, <laughs> we're finding out that a lot of our raw materials to make stuff is coming from overseas. So, you know, there might be a, <laughs> a delay um, on that because so many, so much of the material, the raw material that we're using to make our items are, right. are not here because, hey, America, we don't make things anymore. Um, yeah, I had to hunt down, you know, and look for uh, some materials made in the USA, like the resin and the stuff mm -hmm. that I use. So finally found a company in Detroit that makes, you know, all made in USA materials. And so that's what I'm yeah. pouring into my molds to make the granite and stuff like that. Yeah, that's getting tougher and tougher. Yeah, so for Empire Falls, we, uh, you know, we take our guards through system, we adapt it for World War II, and so you can play historically, or you can play at Weird War with Tesla cannons and death rays. You know, we're not telling you how to play, we're just giving you tools to play with. Um, and uh, and again, um, we think that a, a lot of this history uh, should not be forgotten, and the uh, dedication, yeah, and the dedication and the commitment of the 761st and all the other other uh, African American units that fought that people never seem to use in war games. Uh, I think that's an oversight that that we can correct. Um, and having grown up around so many World War II veterans, uh, Mr. Sylvester White was one of the first Black Marines during World War II. Um, growing up, knowing four Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Irving Kepner, who was um, uh, part of the Flying Tigers. So uh, growing up with those guys, it's, it's, it's my way of giving back for all of the years that they looked out. For me, all the mentorships they gave me and um and it, this is just my love letter uh to them so that's i wanted great. to be able to do that yeah that's great and so if you're a fan of axis and allies then you're gonna love this game yeah uh, yeah and it's, it's a really easy rule system you know it's something that people can pick up in 15 minutes and we teach it at most conventions when we go to it you know we play demo games and people pick it up pretty quick you know um it's not a super crunchy you know 300 page squat leader <laughs> type mm -hmm. of rule book you know it's a small army you need maybe you know 15 20 miniatures and away you go you know depending on how big a game you want to play you know so so for us um being able to get it out there being able to to honor these people um in, in a way that hasn't been done before and being able to make sure that the um uh uh that our the games that we're playing um are fully representative so that everybody that sits down at the table have somebody that they can feel comfortable with, you know, and um, and, I think and that's learn great. a bit of history. Yeah, and learn a bit of history at the great. same time. So, you know, my eight-year-old daughter loves those little tanks and um, all the figures that you make. And I'm proud, you know, and we are proud here at Drakenstone to support your game. And thank um, you. I think it's great to learn the actual history of the brave service members that served our country like my dad and all my uncles and um right my dad served in korea and my uncle served in both vietnam and world war ii yeah and uh they had a lot of great stories but i like to see the complete picture and see the whole story told so keep going you have a lot of fans out there and um i think everybody that plays the game has a great time but the fact that you included these historical elements uh i find is totally epic so more power yeah. to you Thank you. And you know what? Another thing about the historical part of it, it's it's you can come at it at your own pace, right? We're not forcing anything on you. 
you know, what we're saying is these are the stories. And if you want to know more, here's the links to it. Here's more information if you want to find out. Because even doing my research, I find about find out about people that I didn't know about. You know, um, you know, uh, um, there's so many great stories to be, you know, to be told and so many heroes um, that we can use in our games that aren't traditionally used. And I think it gives everybody a jumping end point, whether it's Hedy Lamar uh, making, um, you know, uh, uh, trace signal skipping or uh, whether it's, um, you know, it's, it's people who work the spies, it's people who led uh, the French resistance. You know, there's all these women and people of color who are just not really part of the mainstream st storytelling when we think about historical war gaming. You know, we think about the big battalions and units and stuff like that. And it has a very Eurocentric point of view um, and male. So with this, it gives women a place to plug in. It gives people of color a place to plug in, you know, so that everybody can have a place at the table and enjoy it. And for us at Gaddis Gaming, it's a matter of not taking anything away from anybody else. It's making the table bigger mm -hmm. so more people have seats at the table to play. I think that's great. So if I want to learn more about your game, what website do I go to? Uh, that would be www.gaddisgaming.com, G-A-D-D-I-S gaming.com. And all of our information is there on our blog. We also have a Facebook group, you know, wherever there's social media, there's a Gaddis Gaming where you can uh, find, find information. Right. But yeah. yeah. Well, I've, we, seen we some of your, I've seen some of your boards that it uh, seems like I run into you at all the game conventions around in this area, and you always have the biggest table with the most awesome boards, and it blows everybody else away. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you. You know, again, it's, it's, it's just making sure that, you know, people have, because people forget a lot of it, you know, it has to be fun, too. You know, for us, it, it's edutainment, right, where we can entertain and educate people both at the same time. You know, it's not, it's not a compromise between the two. It, you can have fun while learning. Sure. you know and so and so that's that's the that's the real nucleus that's the core of what makes our company tick and we and we have all kind of games in development but us being a small company we don't have the the resources like a a, a games workshop or a warlord to put or out hasbro you know, <laughs> yeah or hasbro to put out you know multi-million dollar products at a time you know or hundreds of products at a time so for us you know we focus on what we can do with the manpower that we have and the resources mm -hmm. that we have and we really really appreciate that you know the people that come out and support us you know we love our fans we have people who are really fanatical about our miniatures and and really you know just support what we're doing and really like the idea of of being able to do it because i know a lot of my friends you know who are really hardcore guys you know when they were younger and now they're grown and they have daughters and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, you know, I want her to play, you know, I want her to set her to play. I'm like, well, you got to give her a character to play with, you know, you can't expect her to play you, her dad. Right. I mean, she wants to play her own thing, right? So being able to have places for people to plug in and people always ask me at conventions, like, how do you get so many girls and young people to come play your grumpy old historical war game? Because like, we don't have a grumpy old historical war game. Our games are thriving and our youth base mm -hmm. is younger than normal because we make it fun for people, you know? We're not talking about the cycle rate of an MG42. We're, you know, we're letting them build their armies, learn the history, and have fun. And and people have a natural, I think, curiosity about history, but you have to make it fun for them, right? You yeah. have to give them an on ramp, you know, to be able to get to it. And with that, you know, we do that, and 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 we grow the hobby that way. You know, it's not just a bunch of gray beards like me sitting around a table, you know, from 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 from. from. You know, these young people having fun and rolling dice. Matter of fact, right across the river in Windsor, um, before COVID struck, we had the Women of Windsor Wargaming Group, which are all just young girls between like 15 and, and, and 25. And they they had been playing three or four years in a row um, at, at Action Comic Con. And we would go there and we'd set up the tables and they'd come in and they have their armies and they would kick butt. I mean, these were <laughs> really serious games. I mean, I was like, man, I do never, ever, ever want to play you guys because they, they were hardcore about their strategies and about you know winning the game i i thought you know it would be a really fluffy game but no they were serious about it they were focused and they worked together as a team and it was really impressive to see and it's really just shows me the cultural difference between windsor canada mm -hmm. and the united states when it comes to who participates you yeah. know in, in the hobby so you we've know, come a long way away. since uh we've come a long way since risk i mean with the miniatures combined with mm -hmm. uh the strategy of the game 
um, that's what really makes it fun is, you know, even if you're terrible at strategy, yeah, think you about, still think have about what fun. We, with. we had what, Risk, Stratego? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we Risk, had Risk, Stratego, we had Stratego. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all, all the Milton Bradley stuff, you know? And um, so I think that, uh, I think we have a really good future. And the products that you put out help, help bring that environment to life. You know, the tables that we set up, you know, we couldn't do it without the walls and the, you know, and, and the ruined buildings. Right, you know, right. You know, We've got all, all sorts of out. cool things coming out. Um, I showed you the the ruined building there that stacks up and makes a tower. Yeah. Um, this one is really fun. How, how many units is it? Seven? Uh, this is a seven by seven room. Yep. Yeah. You can lay it out flat across the table or you can stack it up, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, Get ver Go vertical. Yeah. Hey, and if it doesn't have magnets, it's not Drake and Stone. So all my pieces have magnets and they stick together. That's so convenient when you're at conventions. <laughs> People are bumping tables, being able to right. magnetize your stuff so it's not bump, so it's not moving all over the place. You know, I really, I, I for one appreciate that. And it's super durable too. And when Yeah, you can't break this stuff. It's not going to melt in the sun, you know. Yeah. And when you're moving things around in totes. <laughs> yeah, you can just throw nothing. all these in a backpack, you know. I'm yeah. not worried that they're going to break or get scratched. Right. Um, these are Whereas not was... painted, okay? These just come right out of the mold with a gray granite look that's just like stone. Right. You can't scratch it off. Yeah, because I asked you at, the, at our first conviction, like, what do you use to paint them? And you goes, they're not. They just come out like that. I was like, what? It's a word of art. <laughs> yeah, because I was like using uh, the Hirsch molds, mm -hmm. and that's porcelain, and you you hit it against something, it's going to chip and shatter. I've broken so many, you know, pieces from using that that porcelain yeah. um, molds that her shoes, you know. The plaster even, stuff is fun for, you know, to get started and uh, then you got to paint it. But, you know, I moved such far beyond uh, plaster and breakable right. stuff. This isn't breakable stuff and it sticks together. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I would only use hers if I had a static display. If I was doing like a diorama or something right. for gaming where I'm putting it away and taking it out constantly. I mean, your material is, is, is unbelievable. I mean, you know, for the purpose of gaming. So I can't wait to show you what I'm launching on Kickstarter what you next, got? next week. Okay. So this is a um, preview just for you. <laughs> okay. So I um, haven't really mentioned it on too much social media media yet. Cause I wanted to kind of surprise everybody with here's the big launch, right? Right. Okay, but you got yourself a dry erase grid mat or gaming paper, and you don't have hundreds of dollars to make stackable dungeons, and you don't have a huge backpack to carry all this stuff. You got 20 bucks, okay, and you're going to game night. What are you going to do? Magnet maps. For 20 bucks, you get all these little tiny blocks that stick mm -hmm. together, okay? They've all got magnets in the ends. And they mm -hmm. come in different shapes and different sizes, right? Mm -hmm. You got L's, you got X's, you got T's, you got long, you got short, you got curves, octagons, you got curves, you got mm -hmm. all these different shapes, right? And you wow. can build any map. So why use a dry erase marker and go, here's a room, here's a tree, here's a door? Why not just yeah, lay it out walls just like this, snap them together right. so that they're not gonna move. Once you snap them together, if someone jiggles the table, they're not going to move around or whatever. Right. For 20 bucks, yeah, you build your little labyrinth. When you're done, whoosh, throw them in a dice yeah, that, bag. Yeah, that's a long way from graph paper. <laughs> yeah, so for people that don't have $400 to build a stackable thing, 20 bucks, you get yourself a whole set of these, and you can build a few different rooms, yeah. including a whole... A deck of maps. It's like yeah. a card deck, but they're all maps. Yeah. So for so for the price of going to Burger King, I could have a whole set of rooms done. And you can take them to every game night because every time you set it up, you can make a different map. So, right. Um, and oh, that's beautiful. Twenty dollars for a bag of these blocks. You get twenty blocks, um, and you can expand it. All the expansions stick together and are compatible with each other. You can even stick them to other um, the Drake and Stone rooms. So, you know, they're totally compatible with the uh, rooms I have now. Ah, so I could put like a water element. I could take a piece of blue card, put it underneath that, make that a water element that they have to go over. 
and exactly. that's just the edge of the wall. Yeah, that's beautiful. It all sticks together with magnets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, trap door. Hey, there's my trap door right there. Oh, yeah, and it's so easy to move during the game. So you could say, you know what? You found a secret door. You just opened it. Your Boom. turn. You don't have to set things up or dig through a box to, well, you know, where are the doors? <laughs> yeah, and it's if you're a yeah, and if you're a DM, the convenience, the setup of convenience and to be able to improvise on the fly, I can definitely see the advantages of that. And you can get a two-dimensional doorway or a three-dimensional doorway that you sell and then put that in the middle of yeah, it. I've got all these different kinds of doors from just doors that open Arches. and archways. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, check out this kind of stuff. It's a magic a portal. portal. <laughs> to Azrioff. My friends. Little... Oh, that's beautiful. How deep is that? Wow. It's like Clouds? a cloud pattern, right? Yeah, the cloud yeah. that, yeah. It has little magic pools, portal. Little, you know, you dip your hand in the holy water before you yeah. step through the portal into yeah. wherever you're going. <laughs> okay, everybody, wash up before you go through. No germy hands. Right. It's actually san hand sanitizer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I'm just really excited about how this project is going with I've made a whole bunch of different maps. And um, so if you're a creative person and you just want to make your own maps, great. If you can't think of any adventures or you just want something canned where you can show up at game night and read a card, you get the map laid out for you. So you don't have to do any planning before game night. You just show up with your bag of blocks. A la carte, right? Dungeon on demand. You got it. Yeah, that's, really, that's a good idea to have a book of pre-made dungeons for people. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's another really good idea. I haven't, I haven't seen to. I know one guy has like a book of two D maps where you pull the book out and then it's just the map on each page. But a lot mm -hmm. of it is outdoor terrain with woods and stuff. But mm -hmm. I think that was another interesting way. But it's a lot of uh, opportunities for people who are gaming in small spaces that maybe don't have a game store that they can go to with a big table to play on. You know, so you're playing at your mm -hmm. kitchen table and it's kind of cramped. Like when I was a kid, we always played at somebody's house at their kitchen table right yeah and you don't have enough space and so you just have this little setup but i tell you it's great to move your figures around and actually see a raised wall where you can see the borders of the room and it just is a lot different than a flat surface where like i said you take a marker and you go here's a tree here's a door let's go everybody uh, I, I'm not feeling it, you know. We've got to have a some something that looks like an actual stone, you know, and it's raised up, and you can walk around it. And for twenty bucks, I think that's totally worth it. Oh yeah, no doubt. The price point is right on. Like I said, you can't go to Burger King for less than that, you know. So yeah, not I everybody like can. Uh, not everybody can spend four hundred well, bucks on yeah, well, a stackable well, thing. <laughs> well, you have a price point to where everybody's at, right? So, it, you know, so maybe I, I get my my PPE, you know, money, <laughs> I get my COVID money and I splurge on some dungeon tiles because I can use it forever. It's not hey, something I'm never going to have to buy again. Once you get your stimmy, then you yeah. can spend it on the glow in the dark pools and the $400 yeah. thing where yeah. it glows in the dark when you turn the lights off. Yeah, because I little yeah, resin because, pools. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Yeah, because I'm like a completist. I like. You know, give, give it all to me at once because I hate like collecting stuff over time. You know, I mean, there's, you know, I guess if you're financially restrained, you have to. I mean, I used to have to do that. I used to buy like one box of Citadel miniatures at a time. <laughs> right. Yeah. The Adventures Party. I could never get a whole thing of orcs together because I could never save up enough to buy a whole thing of orcs. But, uh, you know, uh, Ralph Parth and all those type of guys. So what do you have for, um, for a scattered terrain and for different types of beds and benches and couches and stuff what oh kind man of stuff i've that? got all sort of little miniatures from yeah. i made this little scene is that a rug i don't know if i can hold it up to the camera but we is got that a flying carpet carpets. yeah that is awesome see i want a little, game at your house here's a little scene <laughs> oh, i'm losing my fireplace okay yeah, but this is the um tavern setup where they're sitting around the table yeah the lady is uh serving the drinks she's the waitress and then we have people sitting around the table enjoying yeah. mugs of beer. And um, so I have this whole tavern set up with uh, light up fireplaces. And yeah, that's a whole, see, that's setting the ambience. And that's what you really want as a dungeon master. This is the light up lamp. column. 
Yeah. No right. switches or wires. You just push on the thing and it lights up. And it lights up? And then you pull on it and it turns off. And so you don't have switches or wires or stuff. It's a That's light neat. up light up um tavern. I, I need you to make me some smoke markers like that. So when tanks get blowed up, I can set it on top of them. Yeah, like a flickering orange glow. So it looks like it's that's on all fire. I need. Yeah, that's all I need. Yeah. I can make you those. <laughs> I just commissioned you to do so, sir. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, so there's all kind. Of, yeah. So there's all kind of stuff made out of the same material. So again, I don't have to worry about dropping it and breaking it. You know, I don't exactly. have to worry about the cat setting up the table, getting dinner ready for the guests to come over, and then the cat comes over to the table and knocks all the little miniatures off. It's 100% cat proof. Yeah. Cat <laughs> How to cat proof your game room. This is the solution to it. The secret Perhaps is that. magnets. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, all the little tiny details and accessories make a difference. Like when you oh, put the this on the, you put this on the table and you're like, you start here. It's your turn. It's just kind of epic to have these these little things that you can reuse in every game. So, you know, maybe you find it later and it's the exit. Yeah, people being visual animals, all those visual cues help to immerse people into the gaming environment. And that's what you want. You know, you want the suspension of disbelief. You want people immersed into, you know, the setting. And with all those little, like you said, the flickering lights and the hallways and the furniture, all that helps. I know we had um, uh, at the game store, we had a uh, painting class where people would buy their miniatures and they would bring them in and we would just spend like a Wednesday night painting them up for whatever game they played on Saturday, you know? Mm -hmm. And we had like one night, we had about eight, nine people all just sitting around painting miniatures talking, you know? So the social aspect of it and people having that, um, having that attachment to their character and then painting it, you know, made them even more attached mm -hmm. to it. So that way when they played it in the game, they wanted to see their miniature on the table. They wanted to see their representation of their character. And I thought it was always funny that the really big six foot four, 275 pound guys they'd be playing hobbits and <laughs> gnomes you know and then the little mm -hmm. tiny you know uh you know four foot eleven girls would be playing half ogres <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny because um you know everybody getting together painting sounds like fun but it's still competitive yet everyone's included and that's what i like about um the games that you and i play um mm -hmm. There's that old meme of I went to D and D night and then I got home and and then she asked me, Hey, did you win? Okay, well you don't win D and D and you don't win. Right. Your, it's a cooperative uh, game, yeah. Exactly. So everyone just has fun and plays together and I think that's really the atmosphere that we have to set up and and encourage and um, make sure is part of all of our games and you know, I just don't feel comfortable excluding anyone. Yeah, well, and that's that's what gaming is about, right? I mean, if I, you know, I'm a grown man playing with toy soldiers. If I'm not welcome here, then where will I be? You, know? <laughs> you can't take yourself seriously if you're fighting about yeah. toys. Yeah, we're fighting about toys, people. I mean, come on. You know, so um, so so when you look at it, you know, building a, you know, building an inclusive environment making everybody feel welcome, making a place at the table for everybody. I think that's part of our job as ambassadors to the hobby, right? Whether you're, you're whether you're just buying and collecting and painting, whether you're just building, you know, or you're just buying. I mean, there's people who just read the books. They just buy the books, read them, and they're fun. They never, you know, play it hardly at all. You know, right. so whatever part of the hobby, whatever aspect of the hobby you enjoy, we want to make sure that you as a gamer uh, feel welcome when you sit down at a table with us. You know, you make you feel included. I don't want anybody to feel like, they, you know, that they're not wanted or, you know, or that they're not welcome. Uh, you know, that that just shouldn't be a thing. You know, you have to have uh, a certain social contract is struck between people when they sit down at the table across from each other that you don't get when you're playing computer games. Computer, I just turn the computer off and walk away. Right. You know, but we're sitting at the table with you. At the end of it, win or lose, no matter what we're playing, you know, we shake hands and we leave us. Again, it's a game. And some of the best game I had, I've had my butt kicked up one wall and down <laughs> the other. But it was the funnest game. I mean, I played with um, 
you might understand this, uh, uh, tournament players. Like a lot of these guys, they practice on me because they're getting ready for tournaments of Warhammer and stuff like that. And I bring my army because I don't really play Warhammer. I just mainly paint and collect the miniatures, right? And that's like my therapy. And, uh, and so uh, when I play with them, I know that they have the max min max list. You know, they have the latest stuff ready to go. And I just bring whatever I feel like playing. And they kick my butt all over the table. But it's the funnest time. I remember one time this guy really didn't want to lose his machine gun team. And I was like, you know, um, and I marched my guys out in the open. And they shot every all of them except for three. And I was able to make it to the wall and get in the cover. And then I shot his guy, his machine gun team down. And he was like, oh, I can't believe it. And I go, so what do I need to take out the last guy? He goes, well, you have to roll a six. I'm like, okay, I rolled it. And there was a six. And this guy was dead. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> took him out. You know, yeah, it took him out. But that was my whole goal, like to take out his machine gun team. I didn't worry about the rest of the game. I didn't worry about taking any objectives. And he just mowed me down with his tank. And I didn't <laughs> care, you know, but, but that was the fun of it. Because I know I was there. For him to practice something i know it wasn't there to beat him that wasn't the purpose of me being there because i was never going to do that it was just him testing out his strategy and we had a lot of fun doing it and we laughed and laughed i mean he was really frustrated that i was able to do the amount of damage that i did just goofing <laughs> off you know because he's a tournament guy he's really focused really right. serious but he's you know but other than that he's really lighthearted, and i really enjoyed his painting skills are all off the hook hmm. you know but i really enjoy the whole hobby aspect of it right where you collect your your dungeon, your tiles, your materials for the room, for the table, your trees, whatever you need. You build your army. You know, for our games, you build an army. And I think for D&D games, you build your war band or whatever. Your dungeon exploring people. Uh, you put your party together, right? You put the party together for D&D. And um, so you collect it, you paint it, and you can display. And the people who just collect our stuff and display it. There's some yeah. people who just collect it, paint it, and then put it in a display case. They never take it out for anything else. And that's fine. I mean, we're here for all of it. We are down for all of it. What, however, we can support you. We, we, you know, we want to support you. You know, um, but we have to, again, as us as people who put on games, who go to conventions, and sometimes it's a lot of people's first introduction to war gaming. They're coming off of board games, or they're coming mm -hmm. off of video games, or maybe they've only played D and D. They haven't played anything else. You or know, maybe they, they say, uh, you know, I heard that it was like this. Yeah, or they've read stuff. On, I mean, the internet is the worst place, right? You know, it's a great <laughs> place for resources, but the people in there sometimes are very toxic. So yeah. again, and you get the chance to meet real people in a real environment and, and cut through all the BS. Because I know I refused for about eight years. My friends were playing Warhammer. And I'm like, you know, these are fascists fighting demons. Where the hell do I fit in this? You know, you have clone space Nazis fighting <laughs> fighting demons. I don't see how I'm on either of their sides. I don't see how this works. You know, and then I read the book and they were like, oh, there's a thousand chapters. Make one your own. I'm like, well, there's my, he said, you should have led with that. If I could make <laughs> my own chapter the way it is. But they were talking about the Horus heresy and the emperor and all this stuff. And I was just, I'm like, look, nothing about this sounds fun. It's a grim, dark future. And I'm more of a Star Trek future person. Right. You know, I want replicators and warp travel and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So something yeah. to relate to, you know, it doesn't matter if the, lizard folk take over the octopus heads let's see something you know that i can yeah something i relate to yeah i came out of star trek and then star wars got me as a kid you know and so you know i was all about crushing the empire you know that's that's where my hero's journey was i'm gonna um, show off my uh star wars piece from 1982 so 82 the, the b-wing i painted it when i was seven how'd i do <laughs> <laughs> I think you need another pin wash on that there. <laughs> I think um, I lost the little pilot guy. So that was the 172nd packed. model kit. That was the... Uh, this was a, a model monogram? kit. Yeah, you had to glue Monogram, it yeah. yeah. And it had, had a little together. stand. That um, it sat on. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly so, what you're talking about. Which yeah. fun. And, yeah. I mean, and again, that's how I got into it. Me and my dad, when I was 10 years old, we would just build model airplanes in World War II. I mean, that's what got me into building models and... and, and and hobbying uh, to begin with, you know, the gaming aspect of it as a business came much later on when I saw that there was nobody doing this type of work, you know, and I'm right. like, well, I have enough, you know, I have the ability to do it. So I guess this is my, you know, I can take it on instead of, you know, asking somebody else to do it. And that leads us to here today. But again, the whole aspect of it, you know, whether you're coming from video games, from board games, from role playing games, you know, you know, I'm here for all of it. I'm here for all of it. I think that it's um 
It gives every it gives us the opportunity to practice our social skills. It gives people that are socially awkward a way to break outside of their mold. And um, and, and sure, and, and that's why I like D and D. You yeah. know, because uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, you don't have to be you. You could be a twelve foot tall barbarian that just smashes yeah. things or a yeah like, like i said on paint night i've seen people completely change their personalities you know ba based on their avatar i'm like okay you're four foot eleven you weigh 98 pounds and you're playing the 600 pound half ogre you know in right. the game wow it lets you explore how it might be to be something uh, else to be that and i think it's uh healthy mentally to do that every once in a while to use your imagination or sure, yeah yeah, people miss out on how important imagination is. I know when they were talking about sending kids back to school, they were all about the sports and the collegiate. I'm like, what about the people who are in band? What about the people who are in art class? You know, those people need, you know, just as much as, you know, as anybody else. You know, it's not just all about football, basketball, and baseball. You right. know, kids that socialize in a lot of different ways. You know, because exactly. I know, you know, no, we were friends with a, you know, I was friends with a lot of band nerds, you know. Uh, so I think that, um, that again, um, the the game becomes the great equalizer. You don't have to be physically strong, you know. You don't have to be the most articulate speaker, you know. Um, and I've seen recently uh, a lot of people who are like voice actors and stuff have got on right. YouTube and started doing dungeons. And I'm and I think um, the guy who did the Star Trek RPG, one of the first games that I saw of that, he was a voice actor. And I and dude from the each character had to leave their room to go to the bridge. Like it was a calling. Like everybody meet at the bridge. So he goes, okay, starting here, what do you do? I leave my room. He goes, okay, down the hallway, you meet this person. He was the captain of your previous ship. What do you say to him? And he was just going back and forth. And everybody got to tell their backstory by leaving their room and going to the bridge because they met somebody from their past. And then they were able to talk to them and interact with them. And so the other players in the room got to know their character, not from reading their bio, but from how they interacted with an, with an NPC. And I'm like, what a genius way to do that. And he voice acted each one of those different people. And I'm like, oh, man, what a golden age we live in. What it sounds pretty age. entertaining just to watch, but to play was, is even more fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying for two hours, I was entertained just watching it. I can't even imagine what it's like every week or every month to go and meet and play with these people, you know? I mean, it's just immersive. I mean, and it was nothing, nothing happened at all, except everybody gathered at the bridge and then they ended it after two hours to go on to the next episode. But it's, it's classic storytelling. It goes back right. to ancient, ancient caveman sitting around the fire telling stories. That's what it goes back to. And it's something primal in us, you know, that, that needs to be fulfilled that way. And I really love it. And games in general, I mean, the games that we play are narrative games. They're story-driven games, you know? These, this is the story of the 761st mm -hmm. Saint Battalion and, and, and their battle, you know, at the Stone or their battle at St. V or their battle, you know, wherever they were fighting at. You know, this is this is their their story. And you, you're reenacting that. And each time it can be different, you know, because the, the parameters and the variables are different. Right. But I think for, um, you know, for us. You know, and again, I have several different armies because I want to tell several different stories in several different locations. Right. You know, I want to play in the jungle. I want to play in the desert. I want to play. You know, uh, in, in Western France, you know, I want to do it all. You know, there, I don't want to be, you know, uh, hindered mm -hmm. uh, by anything. You know, I want to have full imaginative and creative range. And that's why I created the weird war element to it, because I want flying saucers and death rays and Tesla coils. I want it all. I want werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I, I like you know, that. I, yeah. And I, and I don't want to limit people. And I think that um, us being ambassadors not only for our brands uh but also uh, for the hobby in general setting forth a positive uh, uh you know first impression for people who come out to play thinks i think is important i think you set the tone for that um in all the games that you know that i've seen you at and all the conventions that i've seen you at and i think that's that's really important for people you know who may be shy or kind of introverted or you know, don't want to bring out i know for me i'm a little bit more gregarious so I'm like, hey, come on over and play. Oh, grab out of the right. Come on over. I see you hovering. Come on over. Take a look. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, usually at my tables, it's younger kids that are like, look at all these cool miniature toys. And then the parents come over, don't touch anything. And then I say, yeah. touch everything. Don't go for touch it. it. You can't I'm break it. Stop you. 
And then the parent yeah, goes, yeah. ooh, this is neat. I need one of these. And so, you know, it's for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, I think another interesting tool that I've read people use is as a family game night. Like they're using D&D to like play or role playing games in general mm -hmm. um, to like to bring families together. And I think instead of like paying money to go to the movies, if you have four or five kids, what a great way to get everybody together and do something. You know, I think that's a really, really good way if you have a younger family, you know, to be able to connect with them, you know, spend some time and really do some uh, uh, some, some bonding. I know that um, our, our World War I game, we had a father, he was a stepfather, uh, who said that his son was really getting into World War I because it was from history class and he wanted to know what we had. I said, well, it just so happens you're in perfect timing because we have a World War I game called Shattered Crown. And we came in and we taught him to play. They loved it. They came back the next week. They played it again. And he was like, my son wants to make a diorama to take to school to talk about World War I. And I'm like, great. So we got some foam. I said, go to the hardware store, buy some two by two foam. And I said, you know, um, so, so I gave him a list of all the supplies he needed. And I went out into the pen. We put some Elmer's glue on a board and we mm -hmm. put the gravel down and some of the sand and stuff and all the different items um, that we needed to cover the board and some brown paint. And I had some gray paint and we just sprayed it up, put the little sticks on it and they look like dead trees. And we made some trenches out of the popsicle sticks and we used um, paper mache to make the, the edges of the trench and the sandbags and stuff. And, uh, and he had a board and they played on that board <laughs> you know until it fell apart but right. you know but it was a great way for them to come out and play the game and they had their armies and they played it all all the time but it was a great bonding experience it was a way for him to bond with the stepson over something that they both had an interest in right you know right. and i thought yeah you know you, you spent you know like 120 bucks and on materials and dice and miniatures and paints and everything and now you have endless amounts of fun you can have together, you know? And I think that that was important. So I think people are seeing this now, instead of me just giving your kid an Xbox and they sit in the corner staring at the TV, it gives a chance for people to come together, connect with one another on a real human level um, and, and fill a lot of that emotional void that's absent from the pablum that you get from playing uh, computer games. Right, right. You get, you get together with other people that are in the room and you can see their reaction to your moves and, you know, there's jokes and you can have a snack or yeah. whatever. And it's, uh, it's a lot different than just playing video games, like you were saying. Yeah. And I, I think it's a little bit, it's more rewarding on a deeper level. It's not just, you know, how quick your reflexes are, you know, to your point, it exercises, you know, different areas of the brain with your imagination. And it also fulfills an emotional component, you know, in people. I think also, so I think it, it ticks a lot of boxes, mm -hmm. you know, when it, when it comes it to that. Cool. Well, this has been Lee Gaddies and Andy Schiller with Drake and Stone. And uh, I think we're out of time for today, but what an interesting discussion. And Andy, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to get on and talk to you. Um, I love what you're doing. Uh, keep up the good work from all of us here at Gaddis Gaming. Thank you for having me on. That sounds great. And we're going to keep our eye on Kickstarter. Kickstarter's hot right now, so we'll keep watching <laughs> what you're up to. Okay, yeah, and we'll keep posting updates and, and let people know what's going on. But our main thing is getting everything in the box and out the door to people so they can start having fun. That sounds great. Can't wait to see right, your Empire. next Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right after Empire Falls, we'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know. There's a, we have some stuff in the works. Let it be a surprise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it for our next conversation, but it's uh it's gonna be out of this world, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> I know that's an inside joke. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.